Located at the heart of the Cambodian jungle, the site of Angkor is a collection of magnificent ancient monuments spread over an area of about 230 square kilometers. This was the 14th and 15th century capital of the great Khmer Empire. The wealth of temples and other buildings on site bear witness to the scale of this administrative and religious center, which was truly exceptional for its time. Angkor is made up of two main sites, the famous Angkor Wat Temple and the royal city of Angkor Thom. To enter the city of Angkor Thom, home to the royal palace, you pass through one of five immense gates built in the city wall. Lining the 300 meter long causeway, which leads up to the Terrace of Elephants, are 54 gods on the left side and 54 demons on the right. From this terrace, the king would oversee processions of troops as they returned victorious from war. To our right is the terrace of the Leper King, symbol of death. This was once a cremation site, and the surrounding wall has some of the most beautiful bas-reliefs in Khmer art. We can make out images of gods and of the giant Nagas, the monsters of Hindu mythology. These two terraces lead up to the royal palace, home to many generations of monarchs since the 10th century. Within the confines of the royal palace is the temple of Phimeamakas, the celestial chariot. The main staircase, still very well preserved, is lined with magnificent lions. This temple was the king's residence. Supposedly, he passed his nights here with his protectress, a goddess who transformed nightly from a snake into a beautiful woman. Most of its ornaments have either been stolen or destroyed, but the temple still has one of the most beautiful views over the site. A little further into the grounds of the royal palace, the Bafun, called the Mountain of Gold, was built to honor Shiva in around 1060. It was once raised on top of an artificial mound, but it had pretty well disappeared under the vegetation until, in the early 20th century, the École Française d'Extrême Orient, or French School of the Far East, unearthed and repaired it. To the south of Siam Reap, the entry town for the site of Angkor, the villages maintained their traditional Cambodian lifestyle. The road is lined with the houses of peasants and fishermen. They are made of straw or wood and raised on stilts to about six to seven meters high. Here, the women chop fruit, the men carry wood, the children play with the pigs, and the militiamen play cards. Away from the hectic tourism of the modern city and the Angkor site, it's from this old village that boats head out to explore Ton Le Sap, which, along with the Mekong River, is one of Cambodia's exceptional hydrological phenomena.
Tunle Sap is the largest lake in Southeast Asia. Like a heart, the lake expands and contracts to the rhythm of the monsoons. The waters are low from February to June and high from July to November. Its surface area increases by four times and its depth by 10 times, a phenomenon caused by the floodwaters of the Mekong River into which it flows. This immense inland sea, which regularly floods surrounding forests and fields, is also one of the richest areas in the world in terms of bird and fish populations. Almost three million people live here. Most are fishermen whose families have been living in these floating villages since time immemorial. During the dry season, when the lake is low, the receding waters leave various sediments which are vital to the agricultural development of the region and to the growth of mangrove trees which are used to make huts. Agriculture is still the country's primary economic sector and a large percentage of the population continues to live in severe poverty. Cambodia's economy is still largely dependent on international aid. However, thanks to the growing textile and tourism industries, the quality of life here is slowly improving. And new houses and businesses are growing up, which show that this remote region of Cambodia is thriving.
95% of Cambodia's population are Buddhist, while the remaining 5% is made up of Catholics, Muslims, and animists. Buddhism has been the state religion since the late 80s. Introduced into the Khmer territory in the 13th century, Buddhism finally managed to win over the Angkor sovereigns, replacing Hinduism as the primary religion. But the Khmers also preserved their animist roots. Their universe is still full of genies and good and evil spirits. This animist foundation, combined with Buddhism and Hinduism, explains the mystic attitude of the Khmers towards the harmony of the cosmos. Most believers hope that their prayers and offerings will ensure them a future life free from suffering. They are good at adapting to obstacles and are resigned to their fate. The Cambodians are a people steeped in spirituality. We return to the Angkor site to visit the Taprom Temple, without a doubt one of the most fascinating of the ruins. Taprom means the Brahma ancestor. Long ago, there was a monastery here, surrounded by a large opulent town. Important dignitaries dined here on plates of gold and slept in silken sheets. The central tower was decorated with precious stones. After the fall of the Khmer Empire in the 15th century, Taprom was abandoned and lay forgotten for hundreds of years. The fact that the site was abandoned to the jungle is one of the things that makes it so magic today. Shaded by massive kapok tree and ficus trees, many of the towers and walls are held up solely by the web of tree roots around them. Any effort to restore the temple would be hazardous because, in cutting down the trees, you would probably bring down large parts of the ruins at the same time. For this reason, at the start of the 20th century, archaeologists from the École Française d'Extrême-Orient, the French School of the Far East, suggested that the site be left as it was found. They also felt it would be a good example for visitors to see how the ruins looked when they were first rediscovered by 19th century explorers. The entrance pavilion is entwined in the incredible roots of the so-called crocodile tree. A great deal of work did have to be done, however, to make the site safe for visitors and to control the tree growth. the image of a once glorious past. Amongst the many local crafts handed down through generations, puppet making is a key element of cultural expression for the Cambodian people. The Cambodian puppets are unusual in that they are made out of buffalo leather using traditional local techniques. Each one is finely detailed, cut and sculpted to represent a different character, human, divine, or animal. The production of the leather figurines is regulated by strict ancestral rules, part of the ritual code which is supposed to ensure protection from the gods and spirits. The origin of shadow theater goes back to the period preceding the Khmer Rouge regime. Local cultural associations and international organizations have succeeded in reviving the tradition, especially in the Siem Reap region. Sebek Touch, meaning Little Shadow Theater, in Khmer, is well loved by both children and adults. 
Using articulated figurines, it stages daily life's preoccupations and is known for its educational and preventative vocation. Since the late 1990s and the end of the 20 years of warfare endured under the tragic Khmer Rouge dictatorship, Cambodia has undergone a rapid economic development. The country has opened up to the world, and thanks to the balmy tropical climate, resorts and tourist complexes have sprung up to welcome intrepid travelers. This, for example, is the hotel Mysteries of Anchor. We have rented this 2,500 square meter garden with my associate Pascal. The Khmer House was the only building here. Today it holds the reception, the office, and the restaurant on the first floor. When we started renting it, the garden contained nothing at all. We have designed and constructed everything ourselves. We have replanted many trees, the frangipani trees, the traveler's trees, and the bougainvillea, to add color. Our aim was to stay local and bring a feeling of authenticity. Researching books on the architecture of the 19th century, we found examples of pagodas and original local houses. There are currently 24 rooms and two slightly larger suites, which can accommodate families. They have a bedroom, a bathroom, and a living room. We wanted the rooms to be simple and tasteful. Our pool of clientele is specific about authentic decoration, and they like staying in these kinds of hotels. Our restaurant is also based on this idea of staying local and being authentic. We only serve Khmer cuisine and many dishes which can seem unusual in most restaurants, as they are homemade dishes. The director is taking us through some of the city's poorest zones, reminders that almost a third of the country's population still lives in poverty. We're going to a place which appears insignificant, but reveals clearly the traumas which this country has lived through in recent years. This is the work of the master sculptor, Di Prung. Follow me. I'll show you our most secret and magical place. These are the miniature anchor temples. These are the miniature anchor temples. They're made by an old man with a degree from a French art school before the Khmer Rouge. He survived the Khmer Rouge period and managed to save the Angkor Vat blueprints he had drawn. Since then, he has made miniature versions of the temples. We have a concrete cast of Angkor Wat, so no need to go in a balloon to see an aerial view of Angkor Wat. Here's a reproduction of the Bayon. He also made this reproduction of the Bante Esrei. Here's the entrance Gopura, and here the main temple. He even designed a basin to recreate the moat around the Bante Esrei. Even the color of Bante Esrei has been recreated. It's quite amazing. Bante Esrei sometimes turns to a pink color. This concrete reproduction does exactly the same. Here are all the blueprints he made. The cuts and elevations of Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat également. 
And here, his manual art worker diploma from the Cambodian School of Arts, which he obtained in 1960. A life of devotion in a country which inspires great passion. Angkor Wat means the town of the pagodas in Khmer. The largest and undoubtedly the most majestic of the temples of Angkor, its silhouette even appears on the national flag. Its moat illustrates the ocean, but also has a defensive role. The walls represent the mountain chain where Mount Meru stands, which is the Hindu center of the universe. Built in the 12th century, Angkor Wat was originally built as a Hindu religious center dedicated to Vishnu, the protector of the universe. It is an outstanding testament to man's devotion to the gods. The beauty and the scale of the temple are so great that some consider it to be the eighth wonder of the world. Since 1992, Angkor Wat has been classified as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The walls of the temple's three galleries are decorated with bas-reliefs spanning more than 200 meters. These archaeological chefs d'oeuvre depict scenes from the two primary texts of Hindu culture, the Ramayana and the war epic, the Mahabharata. Angkor Wat is the only temple to face west, towards Vishnu. The central temple, with its famous 55-meter towers, is made up of three floors, all arranged around a central courtyard and surrounded by a labyrinth of galleries. In the pavilion at the end of the south gallery, we see sculptures of young women bare-chested with large breasts. These are the asparas, the celestial dancers. In the middle of the temple, 12 steep stairs lead up to the inner sanctuary. Their steepness represents the difficulty of attaining the kingdom of the gods. The inner sanctuary was originally dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu, but in the 15th century, the temple, and indeed the entire country, was turned away from Hinduism by the Buddhist cult. Today, all the sanctuaries contain statues of the new god. Abolished by the Khmer Rouge regime as a symbol of luxury, the silk trade is now experiencing an incredible revival. In the mid-1990s, a decision was made to revive the ancestral tradition of weaving. Cambodian silk had once been considered the most beautiful silk in Asia. Here is the silk culture, and here the leaves. These are the cocoons. Here are the males. And they're the females. Each cocoon holds 400 meters of string. The first strings are called raw silk. It is found on the outside of the cocoons. The silk inside the cocoons is called fine silk. There are 300 meters of fine silk and 100 meters of raw silk for a total of 400 meters of silk. Raw silk is used for curtains and roping. And the fine silk is used for clothes. 
as it is very fine. This is the spinning and dyeing workshop. After a week, here's the result. Here the first strings are wound. This is raw silk. To spin raw silk, eight cocoons are put in water, which is heated up to 80 degrees Celsius. After the dyeing process, it is very soft, but very knotted. Automatic machines often break the silk string. This is fine silk after dyeing. For the winding, we spin a bicycle wheel to make small spools. Here we find the weaving plant. Plastic pieces are used to make these motifs. This is our technique. We knot the plastic pieces at several places. We then soak the strings with chemical dyes. You see the dyes do not go through the plastic. This is the weft, the weaving weft, string by string. It is largely thanks to the tourist industry that the silk trade has revived. The high levels of demand amongst tourists for this exquisite cloth led to the creation of new workshops set up to manufacture specifically for the export market. Continuing on around the anchor site, we come to a familiar image, another representation of the sacred mountain chain of Mount Meru. Penumbakeng was the first temple to be built before 1000 AD. It was dedicated simultaneously to Shiva and the God King. This mountain temple is made up of five levels shaped into a pyramid. At the summit, the heart of the temple stands on an esplanade. Only kings and high priests could pray here. The place has a great mystery to it. Phnom Bakeng has an incredible panoramic view over Angkor and the Siem Reap Plain. Khmer art, which is characterized by representations of gods, men, and animals, with a great deal of iconography, developed over a long period, 
Between the 7th and the 15th centuries, as Hinduism was gradually being replaced by Buddhism. In many ways, Khmer art is the art of a religion in decline, even if it did adapt in some ways to the encroach of Buddhism. But Cambodia's recent history and the conflicts which have decimated its populations have broken the chain of these inherited craft skills. Nonetheless, as with the silk trade, state-run organizations and private associations have worked to revive the arts of stone carving and lacquering. An example of this work was the creation of the professional training workshops in 1990. These programs seek to familiarize young Cambodians with the art of their ancestors. For specialists, Khmer art is amongst the most refined of the Asian art forms. It stands out for its rarity and its precision. We return to the city of Angkor Thom. Going deeper into the jungle, heading right into the center, we arrive at Bayon. Bayon demonstrates not only the creative genius, but also the vast ego of the legendary king of the Khmer Empire, Jayavarman VII, who ordered it to be built in the 12th century. The temple has a collection of spectacular bas-reliefs, with almost 11,000 characters covering more than a kilometer. In the East Gallery, a screen laid out on three levels is covered with frescoes depicting the exploits of the Angkorian army in their battles against their hereditary enemy, the Chams. War Chronicles. As for the bas-reliefs of the South Gallery, they give us an idea about the life of the 12th century Khmers with fishing, hunting, and market scenes. Chronicles of daily life. A group of Japanese researchers in charge of restoring the mountain temple described it as the most impressive example of Baroque-style Khmer art, as opposed to the more classical style of Angkor Wat. The bayon was constructed in the form of a three-level pyramid with a maximum height of 43 meters. It's a labyrinth of stairs, towers, and terraces. The original structure had 54 towers. Legend has it that these represented the 54 provinces of the Khmer Empire. The first two levels are square and decorated with bas-reliefs. The third is circular and connects to the towers with their weird and wonderful faces. The ruins of some 37 towers are still visible today, but originally, each one was decorated with four faces depicting the four virtues of Buddha, benevolence, compassion, 
equanimity and equality. In total, there were 216 enigmatic faces staring out across the horizon, watching over subjects in all the territories of the Empire. It is said that the Asparas, with their sensual curves and imposing demeanor, had 64 ways of awakening the senses, and that thanks to their overwhelming beauty, they were able to help the gods keep away evil spirits. Tucked in beside a staircase, an altar, and an offering. The Siem Reap region is devout in its religious and mystical observance. It's worth noting that although the Angkor site as a whole was deserted in the 15th century, the Temple of Angkor Wat itself has always been a place of pilgrimage. For this reason, the town has a number of modern pagoda temples where Buddhist monks study and preach the Dharma, the teachings of Buddha. Buddhism is an individual spiritual quest to attain enlightenment by ridding oneself of egotistical desires and illusions, which are the roots of human suffering. Awareness is the root of selflessness. It's here in town that we find the famous French school of the Far East, a major participant in archaeological work on site. The Ecole Française d'Extrême-Orient was founded in 1900 following the instigation of Indochina's governor, as well as the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres, to make an in-depth study of Indochina before it was colonized. The in-depth study only really started 10 or 15 years ago. There are 15 or 17 teams of different nationalities, Asians, Europeans, Americans, who work in the preservation and restoration of monuments. Temples in particular. The majority of the teams work on the temples. Other teams, sometimes the same ones, work in research, particularly in archaeological digs, in a hundred monumental sites. Some are immense. These monuments date back to medieval times, not ancient antiquity. The first explorers thought they dated back to 3000 BC as they compared them to the time of the pharaohs. The remains, architecturally speaking, are the relics we find above the ground, mainly the temples. All the tools used for cult, the furnishings, ceilings, have all disappeared. In the digs, ceramics account for 90 or 95 percent of the unearthed artifacts. It's extremely rare to find organic remains, whether they're animal or human remains. Ceramics are essential to our understanding of this society. The desire to reconnect to a forgotten or buried past has attracted archaeologists of all kinds to the site, much as they flock to discover the treasures of ancient Egypt in the day. The town adapts as its history is rewritten in the present day, 
and its streets fill with visitors thirsty to discover its ancient wonders. The town's economic boom is built on faith and academic zeal. Bar Street in the old market quarter is teething with hotels, bars, and restaurants, providing visitors with a range of options, from traditional Khmer cuisine to Western and Asian menus. All tastes are catered for. Siem Reap has developed into the epicenter of New Cambodia. Since Cambodia has opened up to international tourism, the town now has more hotels than temples. But despite the fact that the town is growing daily and that the tourists keep flooding in, the town center has retained its traditional charm. The Psar Cha area, which surrounds the old market, still maintains the traditional rhythm of Cambodian life. Dozens of market stalls sell exotic Asian fruits and vegetables. Families from the neighboring areas gather at the market to sell their harvest or the daily fish catch. Destroyed and then reconstructed, Psar Shah now has a vast covered market hall with a tiled roof filled with souvenirs, clothes, jewels, local arts and crafts, and tourists in search of a cheap bargain. A little further out, hidden in the jungle, far from the crowds, is a wonderfully authentic local hotel. The hotel was created in 1997. A Franco-Cambodian couple of architects is the basis of this project. Finishing their study of architecture in France, they decided to live in Cambodia and create a traditional Cambodian hotel. These typical hotels have a magical sense of calm, mostly thanks to their beautiful interior gardens and water features. Under the Pol Pot regime, traditional Khmer culture was completely stifled. Dance was seen as an elitist form, harking back to the values advocated by the Khmer Rouge. Today, the Aspara dance, named after the irresistibly beautiful demigoddesses, is flourishing once again and is one of the key symbols of Cambodian national identity. Every year, dozens of young girls enter the Académie des Beaux-Arts, Academy of Fine Arts, in a quest to rediscover their ancestral roots by studying the traditional Aspara dance techniques. The training requires talent, persistence, and suppleness. The forms of the dance are intricate and precise, and yet exquisitely fluid and elegant. There are 4,000 codified postures in the repertory, and with this range of gestures and figures, the dancers portray the stories of Khmer mythology, from the epic primal poem to the golden age of Angkor.
In the gaps between temple visits, most tourists have time to observe that Cambodia is still a very poor country. Recovering from the satanic terrors of the Cambodian Cultural Revolution will require hard work from everyone, including women and children. The citadel of the women, Bante Asre, is one of the highlights of Angkor. It's entirely dedicated to Shiva, god of destruction, transformation, and the future. Constructed in pink sandstone, the building's color shifts with the changing light of the day. This temple has been especially well preserved and has some exceptionally fine sculptures. Despite its relatively modest size, you can spend hours admiring the magnificent statues, carved facades, and door lintels of Bantier Shre and their depictions of Khmer mythology. As intricate as the work of a goldsmith, but in stone. It was in Bantechre in 1930 that the École Française des Arts Orientaux, French School of Oriental Arts, carried out the first large-scale restoration project, and the success of their work here opened the doors for a number of other projects throughout the site of Angkor. Today, this temple is considered to be one of the most beautiful sites in the Orient. When faced with such marvels, one can't help but think of the words of one of the first Western visitors to the temple. A Portuguese monk arriving on the site in 1586 declared, these temples are of such an extraordinary construction that it's impossible to describe them on paper. They are so different to any other buildings in the world, built with towers, decorations, and all of the refinements that human genius might conceive of. <laughs>